I'm delighted to welcome you all. I'm, I'm Jill Matthews. I'm the current Vice President of the Friends of the National Film and Sound Archive. Um, Chris Emery, whom you can see on your screen, is the actual host of this, uh, this web webinar. I'm the chair of it. And it gives me enormous pleasure to um, introduce Gail Lake. Um, Gail is the current chief curator of the National Film and Sound Archive, where she heads up the curatorial and accessing team. Um, this is a team that's responsible for both the development of the National Audiovisual Collection, and the team participates in a wide variety of interpretive activities as well. Gail has previously worked in a number of um, capacities in the film and cultural sectors, including the Australian Film the Australian Film Commission, Screen Australia, Australian Film Institute and the Sydney Film Festival as director from 98 to 2004. She's been with the National Film and Sound Archive for 12 years. Um, Gail initiated the National Film and Sound Archive's Restores program soon after she arrived, and that's uh, 10, well, 10 years ago now. Um, the pro program has delivered 35 restorations in that period of time. And I'm delighted that we were able to catch um, catch Gail. She's retiring shortly, and we have the benefit of her long experience uh, to explain and to discuss the NFSA Restores program. Thanks, Gail. Uh, thank you, Jill, so much. I'm I'm thinking of uh, retirement as going permanently on holidays. So, um, <laughs> um, so this is yeah. It's um, I'm really pleased to. Um, I think this will be one of my um, last official official um, presentations. So, um, very glad to be here today. Um, before um, I start, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians on the various lands. Um, that we are currently um, gathering. Uh, I'm on a Gadigal land uh, here in uh, Sydney, uh, and it's quite a sombre day in Sydney today as well. So um, I'd just like to, um, yeah, I'll just reiterate that I'm really um, delighted to be here. So thank you for inviting me. So um, the Restores program, uh, I guess, in many ways, was a, um, a a program that really kicked off after the um, finalisation of the Kodak Atlab Deluxe Years. When I got to the NFSA, it was wrong side of uh, wrong side of the road was the um, the last photochemical output um, that I was uh, working on with. Um, the then um, uh, uh, chief curator, uh, Meg Labram. Uh, and so it seemed to me that we were, um, after my experience in moving um, through various um, various um, uh, activities and um, career um, career postings that we're, we're in a digital world, the cinemas had uh, actually, uh, were moving uh, into and indeed had converted to digital presentation. And so the issues were, we've spent many years how, um, in terms of photochemically um, preserving material uh, and indeed creating um, new um, new prints. How are they going to be, um, how are they going to be enjoyed and interacted with in a contemporary digital um, environment? And I can just, um, before I move on, Andrew, I just wanted to say to Andrew Pike, I really enjoyed my time working with him at Ronan Films as well. And very, very, very important uh, person in my formative years. So thanks, Andrew, for that. Okay, so the program um, throws up, um, um, you know, threw up many, um, many different kinds of issues, particularly ethical issues for archives. Um, and obviously, um, as a member of the International Federation of um, of Archives, we um, subscribe to the basic um, the premise um, in the of the digital statement um, that is uh, that is um, put out um, by FIAF. Uh, and you can actually um, you can actually access that. It's on the public pages within that, and that certainly um, basically is the 
is the um, the the foundations for what we're going to talk about and how we address uh, restoration here at the NFSA, um, because there are very um, there are very different um, considerations in relation to ethical um, uh, the ethics of restoration going from one format uh, into a digital realm uh, opens up uh, a number of different um, and very perplexing questions that archives around the world are negotiating um, as we proceed. Um, so basically, um, the background is, as it can, commenced in 2013, and it was um, actually uh, deri derived to deliver a number of outcomes, as um, I've just touched on. Sorry, I'm in the office today, and the lights have just gone off because I haven't been moving. Um, and so basically, you know, the premise is lossless preservation uh, of files that meet archival standards uh, and the ability to um, view classic Australian films in contemporary di digital environments uh, and also derive as close as we can ar archival quality outputs um, for the small screen. Because certainly with the proliferation of uh, streaming um, streaming platforms, over the last uh, decade, there is a very interesting conundrum for an archive in terms of producing uh, high definition files and uh, ultra high definition files that are in a completely different color space for film um, film preservation. Um, so we look at all of this and We've looked at also the um, the um, the context of, um, as I mentioned, the photochemical restoration activity, the traditional um, restoration uh, and preservation activity of um, film archives around the world. Um, and you know they certainly are not limited to obviously to the um, the story of the Kelly gang. Oh, I missed out gang there. Wake and fright, uh, and of course the sentimental bloke has had a number of different. Um, different uh, restorations and versions created over the years. Uh, the Kodak at Lab um, Deluxe um, um, programs delivered new prints um, uh, back in its heyday, that's 75 new prints. Most of those prints now that have um, been created, 35 mil prints, are in the same condition of the original prints um, that um, they were replaced, they were supposed to replace back then, that is the wear and tear of uh, arc of uh, screening. Um, and interestingly enough, we have a, no a number of um, festivals around the world who have said to us, what we can't actually get now is good prints of films from the 1990s uh, because of um, the wear and tear. So that really, you know, made us think about, well, how are we going to present these classics again? Not only for the enjoyment of people who enjoyed the, who um, um, were able to participate in the screening activity um, in the, the first time around, but also to introduce new um, new audiences uh, to these classic films as well, um, and give them the opportunity to actually participate um, where possible in a um, in a cinematic environment, not just on our very fantastic screens that we all have at home these days um, with wonderful sound. So basically we looked at um, the titles selected for the program um, range from the silent era um, right up to the um, uh, to 1999 um, and they range from obviously feature films to also documentary uh, as well. Um, the whole idea is to, um, and also represent the story of it, the national story of, of Australia through our um, audiovisual um, uh, production uh, activities. Full list of films um, can be found um, at that website. If you'd like to put that into uh, any browser and you'll um, be taken there. And that will include um, all sorts of, uh, all sorts of uh, clips and discussion points as well. I didn't embed anything into this slideshow because I didn't want to crash anybody's um, computers at home. Um, but they, um, the most recently com uh, completed is um, the uh, documentary um, directed by Roger Scholes, The Coolbaroo Club, which we did in a concert with uh, Andrew 
uh, and um, the uh, um, original um, original uh, producer and also co-producer and the writer. Um, and we delivered that um, last year and have handed over that film for Andrew, who still has it under contract. And I'll talk about contracting in a minute um, uh, for actually exploitation. And I use the word exploitation in the best sense, uh, meaning that it is available for um, for um, uh, consumers um, to actually participate in. So the selection considerations um, in, in, in looking at these titles and selecting them, and before I you know, go on to that, all films should be digitally preserved in today's environment because in the end, um, it's a bunch of chemicals uh, interacting with each other on a base, no matter what base that is, whether it's nitrate, acetate or polyester. And no matter what temperature or um, humidity that you actually put that original film material in, and that includes the magnetic sound uh, as well, um, there will be, you uh, your archives can slow things down, but we can't actually stop that process. Um, you agree, Andrew? Do you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, looking at the, uh, the this, you know, the selections, we look at the condition of the original material um, that's in the collection and its need for digital preservation, which is the step before um, we look at the restoration uh, process. Um, we look at the film's contribution in telling the national story, which is um, very much part of our strategic um, direction as an archive and as an audiovisual institution in the 21st century. Um, we look at the creatives involved in terms of how it tells the story of their careers uh, and the, indeed their creative process uh, as well. And we look at the impact of the film um, at the time that it was released and um, what it actually said to audiences and indeed what it will um, say to audiences and uh, in this in a contemporary environment. Okay, this is the um, good bit. And if you need to go and get a cup of tea, I fully understand. Um, but I've tried to keep it um, as simple um, as possible. Um, the link there um, is um, to the um, digital statement um, that is put out by the International Federation of Film Archives, and you can Google that. It's on the public pages, um, as I um, talked about at the beginning. Um, it in itself is really fascinating because it does actually state, um, you know, the the considerations that a, an archive um, must um, interrogate itself with um, to actually produce um, produce. Uh, uh, I'm. It'll talk about derivatives. It will talk about restorations. It will talk about remasterings and the differences between those. Um, and they're they're all actually really uh, quite different. So what we try to do at the NFSA in relation to our thirty five mil titles is we produce, um, when we scan it, we have preservation um, scanners. We're about to introduce one new preservation scanner, uh, well, two new preservation scanners, um, both for 35 mil and um, for um, uh, smaller gauges. Um, these are state of the art. We have one um, preservation scanner um, act, um, operational at the moment, a Scanity. We're about to introduce a laser graphics director and a laser graphics um, scan station. Um, over the last a few years, we've been upgrading our, um, not only our storage, but our actually uh, our workflows and pathways to be able to uh, deal with the amount of data that will be derived from the digital preservation of the, um, of the material. And it is vast. I think at the moment, our, Digital, um, our digital uh, library is around about eight and a half petabytes, uh, and that will be increasing um, astronomically um, over the next uh, four or five years. So, dealing with that level of um, dealing with that level of information um, has required um, also looking at the way that we will enable people to search uh, search the collection. 
uh, enable um, the way that people will be able to engage with it uh, as well, um, and indeed actually offer um, you know the correct digital um, the requirements of a, a, a um, digital repository uh, in this age. The archive preserves all of its material in three different places on three different uh, linear tape um, open um, tapes, um, ironically, which is um, which is magnetic. Um, but this uh, the the secret of the internet is it's all back, backed up on LTO tapes. Um, so we make sure that we have um, redundancy in case of um, uh, anything dramatic happen in terms of one of our data centers um, being uh, swallowed by some um, slippage or whatever, or there. So all of the library is actually backed up in three different places and we subscribe to that basic archival principle. So as you can imagine, um, it is a significant amount of data and it is going to um, exponentially increase to potentially up to 50 terabytes at least, uh, sorry, petabytes over the next 10 to 15 years. So what we do is with our 35 mil, um, we produce a raw 4K um, digital picture exchange overscan. So the overscan is actually about capturing the sprockets and overscanning the top and bottom and the sides of the frame so that we don't lose information. Um, and we get as much information as we can. And so that is usually coming from the original picture neg uh, negative. Um, we um, produce out of the restoration process, a 4K digital, um, uh, digital cinema distribution master, which is essentially um, 150,000 on average TIFF files. So um, that is basically the master from which we would go back and um, produce more DCPs. The 4K digital cinema package, um, that is the equivalent of a, a good old 35 mil print that they used to whack on um, at the cinema. So that package um, is actually um, either sent via, um, via um, a hard drive or by digital delivery. And what that does at the server in the um, cinema it's, it uh, then unpacks it and puts it on the cine, the cine server, uh, enabling the projection um, within the cinema. We also look at um, Ultra HD and HD pro, um, files as well for smaller screen. Um, we, um, where we can, we obviously do, um, uh, we produce a, um, a web file, um, which is the master file um, from the final mix or the best available source. Um, that we can. That could be in mono or stereo, it could be in 5.1, um, but we look at um, what actually needs to happen for that contemporary cinema experience as well. So whilst we will preserve um, the, digitized, uh, the digitized file from the final mix as is, we may actually, in concert with um, the original creatives, look at doing a, what we call a soft spread across the front screens. Um, or indeed, in some cases, we may actually look at a soft 5.1 um, sound as well. And this is, I guess, takes it into, um, as I was talking about, um, that um, digital derivative, um, I guess, category. Um, but we have to actually be pragmatic in terms of how audiences uh, enjoy and what current technology and cinemas actually delivers. But what we actually have in the archive is the original um, is the original um, uh, sound as was as was put on the final mix. Um, Occasionally, we will have um, magneto optical discs. They were a bit of a thing, a production thing at the time. So we will take the sound from that. Um, but we really look at, um, at we really look at um, archiving uh, the stems um, as they're known to make sure that we actually get the best possible outcome. What we do for sixteen mil <clears throat> is we at this point in time we output to two K. Um, 
as a DPX sequence. The DP, DPX, Digital Picture Exchange, is a universally acceptable lossless um, format. Um, again, with the overscan um, uh, and looking at um, as we did, as we did, you know, derive for the original picture next. So what happens with um, 16 mil, the production methodology was usually um, to create A and B, or in some cases, C and D roles. Um, and so that meant um, in the production methodology was shots one, three, five, seven were on a, an A roll, and shots two, four, six, eight, we're on the B roll, and within that you might have your um, your um, actual um, uh, credits on the C roll. You may have some optical effects on the D roll. I mean, it depends what has been lodged with us, and we look at the best way at moving um, moving towards that. Um, to create a um, a digital cinema package, we conform that at the beginning, uh, and I'll go through that very shortly. Um, we can form that at the beginning so there is a complete um, a complete linear visual representation uh, of the picture. Okay, that's the part where that's the, the hardest part, everybody. So um, but I, I wanted to spend some time on it because this speaks to um, the prowess of our digital and our audio services team, our film services team, our conservation team in examining all of this material and honouring uh, the integrity of that original uh, original activity. So th the selection, as I said, um, this goes through the curatorial team, the conservation team, film and audio services are really key can, um, uh, contributors um, to making component selection. Um, two of the main considerations, will the original material be safe running over mechanical um, mechanical technology? And if not, what conservation activity needs to be performed uh, to actually make it safe? So our conservation team or our film services team, depending on who's got time to do what, um, will actually go through and do any repairs, any sprocket damage, um, we'll be looking at um, uh, any buckle and wave, how the film has fared over its time. Um, we have, uh, you know, we have the, the, the level of control that we have um, once the material has arrived at the NFSA and enjoyed, you know, its time within climate control conditions. Sometimes we have no control of how it existed before it got to us. Um, but each time a condition report and a conservation report um, is run is run to make sure that um, the material is safe. Um, in buying uh, these new scanners, um, we will be um, these new scanners will actually deal with um, buckle and wave because they're capstan based and the way that they drag the image across the cameras for digitization, where the scanner D uses uh, a different mechanism of pulling their material across. Um, so basically, there is a fair amount of work that actually goes on before we actually get to the fun bit. Um, but it is really quite um, it's really quite important important that we get our um, ducks in a row. So moving on, um, this is the other not fun bit, the contracting um, that we need to uh, look at. So obviously, once we know that we're we're good to go um, and we have this idea we present to um, the copyright owners, the key creatives, and any current license holders um, that um, that um, uh, you know uh, that occur um, in the negotiation. This could be distributors or international sales agents. We want to make sure um, that the um, NFSA is very well um, represented and understood. Our activity our activities are understood by all parties. Um, the other considerations uh, in the contracting is talent um, availability for um, showcase. Um, that's a big consideration because we want to actually be able to present the film, to create debate around the film, to actually get people to understand it uh, in a different kind of way, to present context around it, which is all part of the interpretive role um, of, of us. What's key in all of this to make sure we actually have um, we actually have original key creatives involved in this, uh, in the process too. So that might be the producer, the director, the DOP, the sound engineer, 
um, it, the editor, indeed, it could be even the scriptwriters. Um, so it's really important for us as an archive to be uh, working within the industry um, as well as in our archival, um, our archival, um, I guess, position uh, as well. Because the archive is very much about um, um, the present and the future as it is about the past. And I think that's really important in terms of making this material um, available. What we do also uh, look at is um, if there is an international license holder, and in most cases um, in the films that we're doing now, as I said, and I made reference to the proliferation of um, streaming platforms, um, the notion of territorial boundaries um, in, the, in, in the old distribution sense um, where the world was really um, broken up into different territories, whether it be Germany, North America, France or, or you know, wherever. Um, in a digital environment, unless um, you're geo-blocked, um, the, um, the, world, the world got a lot bigger. So we need to make sure that we have all of these parties uh, involved uh, in all of this. Um, and so, and all of this is reflected into our NFSA restores agreement. Um, we like to be able to um, look at uh, everything um, in relation at that contracting period to make sure that everything is very, very clear for us because what we're actually looking at is a considerable amount of um, taxpayers' money um, that is going towards this. Uh, and so we want to make sure that um, there are no surprises and there is, you know, particularly during the showcase period, um, that we can actually present the good works of the NFSA um, in collaboration and unencumbered. So the sound component um, is actually um, digitised by um, audio services um, downstairs, uh, down in Canberra. Um, and it's sync checked with pitch file um, from film services. That's one of the key things that we need to do, make sure there's no uh, slippage of sound. If there is, um, then we need to actually examine why that's occurring. Uh, if we're missing frames, then we need to go back and look for those frames. We need to actually make sure that um, we, once we actually get into the suites, um, into the grading suites, that everything is going to progress as smoothly as possible. Um, okay, and oops, sorry, I'm skipping ahead there. There we go. Um, the chosen um, um, uh, picture components is digitized by our film services um, uh, specs. Um, the DPX file, uh, sequence is accessioned immediately into um, the national collection. Um, and the A and B roles um, are conformed um, to run as one file, as I mentioned before. So all of that takes place. We also create um, a guide file that is created from the best available um, print um, that assists with grading comparisons, comparison for the external partner. This would usually come from, if we still have one, an archive projection print, because that grade has been approved um, previously um, by uh, the key creatives. And so that will help um, really inform um, the grading process, um, which I'll talk about very shortly. So an external partner, why? Um, <clears throat> basically, um, we have a lot of um, competing pressures within the archive. To actually um, externally, uh, to actually clean and to grade um, the picture, um, that can be a um, two or three month process. We have a lot of preservation pre um, pressures within the archives in terms of uh, film services and audio services and indeed video services. So to take people off the tools um, with the volume that we actually um, have um, that we need to deal with in terms of digitally preserving um, the national collection without any restoration activity. Um, we look to actually go to market um, uh, with uh, post-production houses um, that um, we have worked with or have um, we've newly engaged with um, and have, we have to go through a tender process um, annually. 
which is um, part of public service requirement that we must do. Um, and so we look at experienced post-production houses um, and the process in terms of the tender itself can take up round up to six weeks. Um, we have to file a report that has to meet our procurement guidelines as a public, uh, as an Australian public service agency. Um, and so once all of that is signed off and we've selected um, the partner, we've gone through the adjudication of the, um, the presentations that have been um, sent to us, um, we then actually get down to the, the restoration part. Um, so the meeting, a meeting is always set up um, uh, with all stakeholders to set um, the expectations. Um, we make it clear that we're um, pursuing a restoration uh, rather than a remastering, that is, the fix-ups um, that are very much available through contemporary um, software. Um, we're looking as um, uh, to present a film that is to the closest possible um, uh, version as it was enjoyed when it was at first release. Um, and so this where if you take time to go into the digital statement, this is the issues in relation to uh, a full restoration, a restoration and a digital derivative. Um, so it's it's not perfect, um, but it is um, where we are. We um, look at obviously preserving grain um, and those things that were represented in that in that first um, that first interaction um, with the film. Um, we look, we set up, um, uh, we discuss the original production of the film, any pain points, uh, issues that may affect um, the restoration. Um, we um, establish the original um, creative's um, uh, availability. We set auditioning sections, uh, sessions for work in progress. Um, and the overall um, timetable um, also is established that looks at marketing collateral that we want to derive from the newly um, restored work and what those needs are. So um, this would be, we like to take our stills and our images that represent the restoration, the newly, um, the newly finished um, film um, from the actual frame grabs from the film itself rather than the original, um, the original um, stills, uh, marketing stills that we used at the time. We always look at putting in a bit of a two-week um, contingency in the level, um, in the schedule. Um, the grade can take about um, two to three weeks full-time over probably around about a two-month period. Um, and the, uh, the cleaning itself can take up to two or more months, depending on the original picture negative uh, and indeed um, the work that is involved there. Um, the cleaning process is part automated and part, man, man, uh, part um, manual, frame by frame. And the director or the editor or the producer or the DOP, it's at these points that we invite people in to give commentary on uh, the work that is in place to make sure that um, we have agreement from all parties. So the showcase period, we look at domestic, we look at international, um, we look at avenues via cultural diplomacy, um, and we work with our licensed stakeholders, um, as I mentioned before. Um, we are mindful over um, the last few years, well, particularly the last decade and a half with the proliferation of streaming platforms, um, that um, international distrib distributors and sales agents, um, you know, really want to support their back catalogue. They have a very hungry beast that they're feeling, that they're um, feeding. Um, and we are mindful, um, you know, to support not only the original creatives in benefiting from their intellectual property, um, but also the distributors as well, because um, the more people that actually get to um, uh, experience the film, um, the more uh, the more successful we are in spreading the good work of the NFSA and indeed providing historical um, access to material um, that has been created over a, you know 130 years of Australian creative output. Um, we our showcase premieres are considered quite early in the piece. Um, we begin our um, discussions with festivals of all kinds. We initiate hospitality and networking events. Um, 
that support contact with creative industries and philanthropic uh, support, as well as government and the general um, film going community. And we look at our international um, festivals and screening partners that could range from um, A-list a festivals to um, our looking at our um, relationships with um, MoMA. And indeed, you know, we also are very mindful of our relationship uh, with um, with um, our local Southeast Asian uh, festival activity too. So in the case of this, Clara Law's Floating Life screened in many, many, many Asian film festivals. Um, and so that was a really great benefit um, to us. Um, we presented, um, we um, restored um, a Strictly Ballroom um, for its 30th anniversary and indeed um, the anniversary it, it screened at Cannes. Um, fortunately, it rained and it was on the beach. Um, but it was a beautiful piece of work um, that actually preserves the film. We have currently um, two, um, two different, uh, two more um, restorations um, that are in um, various stages of um, progress uh, at this point in time. Um, and we'll be looking at, um, I'm about to do um, uh, budget bids for those um, uh, next, the next contingent uh, of festival of um, uh, restorations as well. So I don't want to keep talking because I'm sure that you're sick of um, my voice, but that just basically gives you an idea of the considerations of an archive. It's both ethical um, from an archival practice, but it's also, you know, um, the the NFSA straddles a commercial world uh, as well. So there are very, very um, um, varied um, uh, considerations in this whole process, um, but it has been um, really, you know, really wonderful experience in 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 participating in this. And um, I won't be here. I'll be here for um, at the NFSA where we will um, be presenting our next restoration um, before June. Uh, and um, I'm looking forward to an invite back to uh, witness the um, and participate in the second one. Um, that is currently in its contracting stage. So um, are there any questions that people would like to um, um, raise or discussion or let me know? I'm trying to get the picture of everybody up here so I can see where we are. Um, right. Um, we had one question early on from um, Bruce Watson on the question of what is a, let me just check this, um, what a soft center spread means. Uh, so basically, a, say for a mono, um, say for a mono film, um, that in in um, in old, you know, in um, older cinemas, in a that came from the center, the center speaker. Um, what happens now within the way that um, cinemas are set up? Um, obviously, there is stereo, um, and there is what's called five point one, where you get the surrounds at the back. Uh, in term in terms of um, these these are presets um, in most in in cinemas, and so having everything out of the centre speaker um, in the way that cinemas are configured um, won't be um, the best possible um, best possible result. So we try and pull out um, um, the um, the um, the dialogue and make sure that that is actually um, it, it's actually a, a balanced presentation for the enjoyment of of, of the cinema goer. Well, I have a question um, myself here, um, which deals less with the, the question of the the technical side of the digitization process, but more about the selection of the films that you restore. Um, I did a quick calculation um, from the list that's on the website. Yep. And there are two films from the 1910s, four from the 1920s, three of which were US productions, none from the 1930s, one from the 1940s, none from the 50s or 60s, and then we build up a bit. And from the 70s, there are six, from the 80s, there are 11, and from the 90s, there are nine. So really, that's not my question derived from... 
the NFSA is now celebrating its 40th anniversary. Yeah. And it came from the old National Library film collection. Was there a limit to what was collected by the library, which means that all of those those um, films before the the um the sixties are incomplete? Are they? Is there a limited number of them in the archive, which leads to that paucity of earlier films? Well, we have you know quite a number of film historians uh, on the call here, but it was about actually. Um, um, you know, a lot of a lot of the um, uh, the early work um, was, has been lost, particularly from um, during the nitrate years. Not a lot has uh, has survived. I want to say about ten percent. And Andrew, can you nod if that's around about correct? Yeah. Um, and so, um, in uh, and then production um, certainly production. Uh, uh, in Australia um, was subject to um, and distribution and exhibition activity. So we kind of, our production activity, um, we really decreased. Um, and so it really depends on, um, you know, on, on what was that, what was actually collected. And I mean, we did, I think the archive did a lost film search uh, um, and you know, we have collected um, as much as we can find. That said, there is always things with um, with private collectors who are sitting on um, different um, different collections. Um, we're hoping eventually those, you know, some of those private collections um, will come to us. Um, and we're looking at um, working with, you know, what we had. I guess the, in the film industry really took off again um, probably um I want to say during the the new wave in the 70s as it was referred to but you know we did have other we did have filmmakers um, um you know working constantly through the um through the period the Chevelles of course Cecil Holmes um the actual collection dates back to about it will it, the collection itself will um, be enjoying its 90th anniversary um next year uh, as well. And so, um, you know, we see that as um, in its various different incarnations on how it actually ended up at the um, at, at the NLA and then finally to the NFSA. Um, we're looking at, you know, doing as much work as we can. Of course, we have other other preservation outcomes and, and restoration outcomes. The Corrick collection um, uh, has been, you know, um, subject to many, many, many um, decades of work um, with um, the Corrick family, who we maintain a really good relationship um, with um, um, out of Tasmania and indeed all, all over Australia. So we went through that photochemical um, activity uh, and then we decided to go through a digital preservation again to be able to um, to promote um, to promote the work. We have a lot of work to do. Um, we have a lot of work to do um, in relation to um, uh, in relation to um, you know our experimental um, collections too that are really important. Um, and we're looking at um, I'm hoping to initiate at least some ideas uh, around that uh, as well. And so we're looking at, um, you know what we can do with um, with the Cantrell collection. I mean, there is you know there's a vast amount of non um, feature length material within the collection as well that needs to be um, celebrated and provided access to. And there's a follow up question from that one from Amanda um, about the three American films showing um, in the restored program. Um, she's asking, are there other archive agencies throughout the world that are working on Australian films? Do you know of any? Yeah, I mean, we did those because of Snowy Baker and mm. um, his work um, as an actor and indeed his his impact on both as a sports person and indeed, um, uh, and indeed um, you know, his work. I mean, he went, he went and um, uh, I think, yeah, I mean, the, the two works, I think were really um, important that he produced there in uh, in the states, and we thought it important to celebrate Snowy's um, acting achievements. Uh, I think as well. We had great debate about it within the within the NFSA whether we would do that, um, and so uh, but it was decided 
um, that um, that we would proceed with those Snowy Baker uh, films. Um, there are people working um, uh, around, um, and it's amazing what you find uh, in other people's collections as people are becoming more sophisticated in looking at um, in looking at um, what is in their collections. Um, so you will find um, you will find um, um, Aus, you know you will find Australian titles uh, elsewhere, and indeed, particularly, we will find um, some international titles um, that we're um, that we're working. I mean, we work with the um, we work with the um, everybody from the Li Library of Congress in um, providing lost films. On the FIAF website, there is uh, an, a, a, there is um, an index of lost films. There is calls that go out amongst the archives all the time, saying we're working on this. Do you have this? Um, there may be um, titles in the national in the NTLC, which is a lending collection that's separate from um, uh, separate from the national collection that is licensed at. Um, for um, um, uh, for different kinds of uses um, through film societies and whatever, and occasionally one of those titles may be of actual interest. So we'll bring it, we'll take it out of the NTLC, put it in the national collection, um, and digitise um, that material. Um, we remain; it's a very collegiate, um, a collegiate. Um, a group of archives, I think around about 300 or so um, across across the um, the globe. Um, but you know, the aim is to actually look at audio visual um, audio visual heritage uh, and make sure that it is actually um, is actually available. If it falls out of our collection remit, we may look at um, um, uh, negotiating a repatriation back uh, to the um, uh, you know, to the country of origin, um, and that can work both ways as well. Um, but th they are they are considerations. Usually, in the case of if we do find a lost Australian film somewhere, um, we will um, we will work with um, with that um, relevant archive and indeed um, copyright owners to make sure um, that we can get um, an, an end result. And indeed, if we do go through, through restoration, we'll make sure that the, um, the archive in which that was, um, that print was found or that, that negative was found, um, they actually get a digital copy so that um, it's still reflected in their collection as well. Um, another question from Gary about whether there will be any new 35 millimeter prints made for cinemas that can manage them um, or is, is it purely a digital product this is a digital um, um it's a digital outcome for us um the nfsa never had a um a color um a color film uh, a color film lab it was had it would had black and white um kit in canberra um in terms of actually you know the decision being made to um uh, to look at a digital um a digital archive we um you know we we have stripped out and invested a significant amount of money that we were able to um, attract from government to actually um, create um, digital outcomes that said um, we do participate and have recently acquired uh, through the um, uh, BFI um, film activity um, a couple of prints and a new negative of picnic at hanging rock the director's cut so where those um, where those um, opportunities do um, do um, um, arise, we make sure because having access to a thirty five getting access to a thirty five um, mil print is very very rare these days. I think we have around about maybe four or five cinemas in Australia that can actually screen thirty five mil now, and particularly in the case of our archive projection prints, we require. Um, um, the um, uh, we require those prints to be screened on um, um, stems, which is two 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 um, two different um, projectors, so that we don't lose um, that pr that frame every time uh, prints are put together on a platter. Um, a question from Andrew. 
Um, with all the titles where current distribution doesn't exist, is there an attempt to find appropriate distribution for the restored films uh, to get ongoing exposure to the NFSA's restoration work? Sorry, could you uh, you dropped out then? Sorry, could um, you say where where there's where there's no current distribution with mm -hmm. old films? Is there an attempt to find appropriate distribution for the restored films uh, to get ongoing exposure of the NFSA's restoration work? Yes, and that's why we, I mean, what we're finding, because over the last, as I think I referred to in the um, in the um, file, in the uh, presentation, um, a lot of a lot of um, film older titles, and I'm saying mainly from the 70s onwards, have been really signed up for um, distribution um, by distributors because again they're feeding their very big um, their very big um, uh, and hungry um, um, platforms um, uh, video platforms um, for the the older titles uh, yes I mean certainly those films um, that um, exist that don't have distribution it's a matter of um, us looking at where we need to, um, how we can work with with other with with commercial entities. But again, we're also mindful of you know things like copyright and you know uh, and the copyright. Uh, we do exist under a number of um, exemptions set out in the Copyright Act of 1968, um, and we're very mindful. Of, we're very mindful of of the parameters of that. Um, Michael has asked whether we can take, I, I can take questions and raised hands as well. Indeed, I can. Um, you have to, have to make a, a very big gesture, though. Um, while, you're, while you're waiting to, to wave your arms, um, David has asked about the range of costs in restoring an old 35 millimetre film. It depends where, um, it depends um, where, um... what you come from uh, as well um, and so looking at I mean we always try and come from the best available sometimes the only available um, will be listed as preservation items I mean we have on occasion um, our preservation item because we have various um, various levels within our within the catalogue so there'll be you know preservation item a distribution and then there'll be the access um, the access item. We actually have had on an um, where we haven't found anything um, back in uh, the old days. We've had to list a VHS as the preservation item because that's the only thing that existed. Um, and you know, then it goes back to sometimes sheer good luck um, to actually find better quality material. Um, we also might have more than one kind of um, interpose or something like that within within the collection. So it varies. Um, for a, a good restoration, it could um, range up to um, you know around about hundred thousand um, dollars. Other archives spend a lot more in some cases. It could also you know it, but then you're at the lower end if you're you're looking at um, a remastering, which is very different, um, you might be able to um, get a good enough small screen, um, a small screen result for twenty thousand. We're an archive, so we have to go top end and the best possible outcome. Because what what the thing is about these files in fifty years' time, whatever is produced, they become they become the truth. And so um, one has to think about, you know, what, constantly thinking about what is what is the requirements of now in terms of providing access, but what actually is um, what becomes the truth in 50 and 100 years as these files go through migration after migration. Michael, were you waving your arms around? Yes, Jill. Can I ask a question? Please. Okay. Uh, Gail, it would... Very, as a fellow professional archivist, um, I must say it was a very impressive presentation in regards to the professional standards that the NFSA applies to its work. Um, having recently come back to um, move to the region and, that and, and been involved with the NFSA a bit, 
I noticed that basically there's no Australian, there's, there's basically no Australian film heritage on any streaming service anywhere or DVDs or it's really, it's almost impossible to find anything. So I therefore see the NFSA's role in recent years has been a failure to actually promote Australian film. Now, it's obvious that the NFSA has been doing a hell of a lot of work, people such as yourself in the background. But digitization is not just about preservation, it's promotion. It's supposed to enable promotion as well. And the fact that um, there's no iconic collection of Australia film available for schools and higher education facilities, um, even films such as For the Term of His Natural Life, all that, uh, you know, all, all those famous Australian films, they're nowhere to be seen. Someone like myself has no access to any of that material apart from really low quality material that's been just put up on YouTube, including the version of For the Term of His Natural Life. So 1927. So I, uh, I'd ask you the question, do you think the NFSA can take, can actually take a proactive role in exposing Australia's film heritage? Because you've outlined to us all these um, showcase examples, the problems with the complexity of the contracting phase, it's almost as though um, there's, that this is just going to continue because the NFSA is not actually taking any proactive role in saying, right, we've got all this material, we're going to make it available for the Australian community. We're, no, instead we're just going to rely on commercial ventures and that. So as I speak here now, uh, it, it's, it's not seen. It's got it such a low profile. And I think even though all this work's being done, I, I I wonder if anything's going to change uh, because you mentioned the post seventy or all the streaming contracts and things like and the problems there. So that prior to nineteen seventy, it's just a blank. I think I mean it's something that we're looking at, and we had to get to, um, and that that is a question that we're looking at at the moment in relation to access. Um, we're looking at. Um, Distribution has always been um, um, uh, being an, an active distributor. We provide access to the collection through our access teams. Um, but looking at um, our own um, platforms, it's something that we're looking at uh, for the future. Um, and indeed, um, it's looking at the changes that um, I'm recommending for the, the um, NFSA Restores Agreement reflects that um, some of what you're talking about. But uh, distribution, active distribution um, is in some ways, it, it's it's been a bridge too far, but it's something that um, we're looking at. We had to actually, um, we, you know, without the uplift, particularly for the film um, collection, I mean, we talked about uh, magnetic media, Um quite a lot over the last um, the last 10 years. And, you know, we've increased our, particularly for our video, um, we've increased our preservation activity from about, I don't know, I think it was around about nine streams to 20, we currently have 27 streams um, and chewing through that magnetic media to actually get um, uh, digital outcomes. Um, the It's taken a while. And as I talked about at the beginning in relation to the, um, the um, um, digital preservation, we have a lot of titles, a lot of films uh, to work through uh, in terms of digital preservation before we can actually get to an access outcome on that. And so that has been the, um, the focus to move, um, to move into that, uh, to move, yeah, to move into that sort of distribution, that set of distribution considerations for the future. Well, how, how do you select out of that, that vast quantity you're describing to, of, of a backlog to work through? How do you select priorities? Going to, to Michael's question about heritage and, and the... Um, and we look at, I mean, it is it is about, you know, it is about um, assessing, um, um, you know, the condition of material. Um, that is a big one. And ironically, many years, I mean, uh, ironically, nitrate did wait. Um and but it's looking at it's looking at the acetate um, acetate format um, at this point in time that is also um, that is a consideration for me. The sixteen mil A and B roll collection I think is really needs work. 
Um, but now that we're going to actually um, go from um, um, from um, you know the, the the full the full preservation scanner that we have operating now to three is really going to um, increase that. But we had to put everything in place before we could actually get to that. Then, of course, there is the um, the um, I guess the socio uh, the social um, um, importance of the film, what the film was saying, who was involved with the film, um, and so all of these things um, all all of these things become um, a not an uh, a, I'll call it an imperfect selection set of criterias. Um, because nothing is perfect, um, but we're doing the best that we can uh, in terms of also meeting the strategic priorities um, of the agencies and also looking at the marketplace as well. Um, a question from Peter. Um, there are many films that were made in the 50s, 60s and 70s for and by the Melbourne and Sydney Film Societies which are important social histories and should be reserved and preserved. Is there a way of, of capturing that essential film output by the NFSA? Um, look, I think, uh, uh, is this the co-ops um, that are being referred to or the the film societies? Film societies is okay. specified here. Um, look, it, it also depends on what has sort of found their ways to various state libraries as well. Um, and indeed, we have had um, we have had you know a number of titles. We work closely with the State Library of New South Wales. Um, of course, we work closely um, with ACME and all of the all of all of the um, the um, state bodies. Um, and so it is about actually finding what we have. We're introducing a whole new um, internal search. Uh, facility that we've been exploring um, it's been complicated that is really going to help us um, uh, is really going to help us um, uh, in the act of um, you know much more in-depth discovery um, in terms of the collection um, and so that in itself um, we have things like you know every every archive has a backlog uh, we're looking at our backlog um, and how we can address that um, and so there are things there are things happening in the background. We need to discover what is um, in the collection in a much more in-depth kind of way um, than um, than we've had because we accumulated quite a lot early on, um, and we've um, been dealing with um, a, a plethora of material that comes to us because we're not just a film archive. We're also broadcast, we're also radio, we collect documents and artefacts, we are looking at video games, we are looking at extended reality, um, all of those complex digital objects. So it's, it's we're unlike a lot of other archives in that we um, have uh, a very, very, very large remit. Uh, and so it's gonna be the archive in the next little while, it's about prioritization and seeing what we can do. Um, but you know the the aspirations um, are univ you know universally huge. Um, the um, the uh, capability and the capacity is something that we're building too. Ray, you had a question. Uh, yes, I just I guess it's uh, just a passing comment, um, um, Gail, that uh, in the non theatrical collection there are sixteen mil prints of. Um, a lot of the films that <laughs> probably ought to be available digitally, uh, all the Sydney Sound films, the, the FT films from the 30s, yeah. uh, a lot of the Chevelles, all these things, they're there on 16 mil and actually be borrowed by people who've got 16 mil projectors. Yeah, um, which is... Which is... Which is access, but, yeah. <laughs> but times pass us by. We don't, we don't have these available digitally now. Yeah. Yeah. Um. There's a comment about uh, whether crowdfunding is um, in, is employed, whether, whether you're using that as a way to raise funds for the restoration program. We crowdfunded proof. Mm. Um, and often crowdfunding can, um, that, that takes a lot of effort to crowdfunding, to crowdfund something, um, because it requires a very, very um, extensive um, campaign. 
I think um, something that our CEO, Patrick McIntyre, is very interested in looking at is, you know, further uh, is uh, philanthropy. Um, and it's I know that that's that's certainly you know on um, his agenda over the next uh, little while. But crowd uh, crowdfunding um, is is a possibility, but we're also part of our activity in the next little while is looking at a CRM, which is essentially a um, it's a relationships manager database. So what I my my people are dealing with in terms of acquisition. If there is something else happening within our public programs, then that may actually, um, um, you know, may actually um, link up to something that we're doing. Uh, we're doing. We're looking to maximise our information across the agency um, to make sure that we uh, focus our activities and that if um, if um, opportunity arises for a philanthropic effort. Um, because we're looking at some kind of library refresh or whatever. We're just making sure that everybody across the agencies, because we're a big beast um, in our own way and a complex beast within the NFSA, we're looking to actually make sure that internal sharing of information really optimises our um, capacity to do the best by the national collection and providing access to it. So... And that's a, you know that's a very wordy um, a very wordy sort of um, description of we're trying to make sure that the information across the agency um, across all of the different um, all of the different um, business sections is actually centralised in one in one um, one place where kismet can happen. Uh, there's a follow-on from Michael's question, um, which is about what happened to Australian Screen Online. Um, that was put to um, rest, I think, was that just before I joined the NFSA? It's. I know that. I know that. I know that, um, I know that our online um, our online team are looking at it. It still is. It still is. Pop, it still is quite popular. Uh, in terms of um, the educational sector, but I think that program was um, put to bed because of the, um, you know, the cost involved. In 2014, people have to understand that we went through a severe contraction of um, money, and as Ray and everybody else on here would know, the life cycle of an, the archive goes like this uh, in terms of funding. Um, and um, so, you know, we're now coming out of it and hence the development of, of the, uh, you know, our practice, both in terms of collecting, um, preserving and sharing. So it's a rapid expansion. There are, I'm not going to say there's not growing pains. There are, um, but it's good to have growing pains. But we also have to be mindful and be very pragmatic about, you know, a lot of things can happen. In terms of um, public funding, nothing is set in stone. A question from Richard: How confident are you about digital preservation? If the backup to the new digital masters is LTO tape, can you talk a bit more about the archival properties of that format? Well, that's universally. I mean, it's universally accepted um, that we're. I mean, we're about to migrate. I think to. LTO8 um, and uh, because we need the storage that um, the progression from LTO6 to LTO8 um, can afford us. Um, it increases, I think, storage capacity by about uh, 12 times, I want to say. Um, so, um, you know, it's 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 what we th what we think is the best way forward. We could not afford um, to actually um, maintain um you know, photochemical preservation. Um, we think the properties are the sound, you know, we, we as I said, we um, subscribe to um, um, the, uh, FIAF, we sub, um, to, to, those, um, to those parameters that are set down. And, you know, there's some really great, um, there's some really wonderful documentation. Um, and I'm about to go to um, the um, FIAF conference in Bangkok. Um, uh, on next Saturday as well. 
and I'll be talking to quite a lot of people there to look at, um, you know, very, very much these questions that have that as that have just been put there as well. Um, you know, ideally, yes, would it be great to be, um, you know, a Hollywood studio and and um, you know, um, printing out on film and sticking it in a salt mine? Yeah, that would be fabulous. Uh, but the money involved in doing that is um, is um, elusive. Do you have any historians, film historians, on your Restores program team? Um, me. Uh, <laughs> um, look, we have um, we have a team. Um, uh, we have a team um, uh, that works. Um, you know, our film services team. You know, date back to um, people who worked at Deluxe um, in terms of the technical. Um, and we look at, um, you know, we really look, we consult with people from uh, time to time, certainly in the past, um, we've consulted with Andrew, um, we can take suggestions. Again, we have enough money to probably do two full restorations a year. Um, and, um, and the, re you know, and the human resourcing to cope with that too, amongst all of the other preservation activities, our BAU that is not seen as well because it's it's you know all of the all of the um technical suites are constantly churning and indeed you know i mean i've just approved um ray might not like this but i've just approved uh, we've got a um some nitrate which um, came out of the vault the other um the other day and um over a period of three three months its degradation has been profoundly um speedy um, and so I've said, get the middle bit out and see what you can retrieve. But also our conservation team will be really um, um, working with other archives around the world in terms of what in, in particular, in particular cases, in this particular case, why it was so quick, because we don't know. Do we know what the so, film was? Sorry? Do we know what the film was? I'll tell you afterwards. Okay. <laughs> It was a, um, it was, yeah, a short newsreel. Okay. But real one of it's fine. That's the weird thing. Real two. Hmm. I, I was just thinking of, of um, with with some of the earlier films where you get uh, reels and and segments um, missing and, and needing to find them elsewhere. And the reconstruction of mm. the film then becomes a, a, a quite serious um, task for not just technical um, knowledge, but also historical knowledge and, and whether you have people sure. who, who make sure that you get the reels in the right order. Yeah, I mean, all of that. I think the thing with the cheetahs, we had to use um, some 16 mil um, some 16 mil footage to recreate the cheetahs because it was the degradation on on the 35 mil original material was so bad it was irretrievable. So you do the best that you can in observing, yeah, ethical, um, an ethical approach. Donald, do you want a question? You're muted. You're muted, David. Is that me? Yeah. Okay. Go uh, up. Prior to two years ago, I worked at the University of Wollongong. Oh, sorry, um, D David. David was had the call. Uh, David, David Donaldson. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. Okay, okay. <laughs> just to the point that Jill was making, and the uh, way that you restore from bits and pieces, we must remember that, uh, and it's uh, seventy years ago, uh, when the kid stakes was being uh, found, and uh, nobody knew anything about anything. It, of course, was in many pieces, and it was put together in in the kitchen of Jack Kennedy by uh, uh, John Morris, later became the chair of the Film Finance Corporation. But in those days, he was a first-year medical student. Anything we see today of the kid stakes is what was put together by John Morris in Jack Kennedy's kitchen. And and you know and you know David that sort of reflects the um you know what becomes truth. Exactly. Yes. Mm. 
Um, sorry, Michael, you had a question. Yes, thank you, Jill. Um, Gail, but prior to two years ago, I worked at the University of Wollongong and um, the library there, the archives there, we had a substantial uh, film digitization program. And I know there's universities all around Australia who have, like we, we were digitizing the Win 4 news footage from 1968 through to about 1980 using the firm here in Canberra. I know Newcastle. So there's a lot of there, there's a lot of um, film digitization being carried out in Australia, actually, especially amongst mm -hmm. the academic sector. Um, I don't think we ever had any real contact with the NFSA at the time. I, I my view is that the NFSA should be should be taking a lead in some of that in coordinate, not necessarily in doing it, but just in you know as the lead cultural heritage organisation in Australia in, in regards to film and sound archives in some way working with all those um, groups that are spending millions of dollars actually on digitization programs um, in working with those in some way. Has, has that ever come up during your discussions over the years? Again, Michael, it just sort of goes back, um, it goes back to resourcing. And I mean, down uh, where you um, produce, um, so you're producing news, uh, were you looking at over scans and, and delivering that or were you scanning to the frame? Uh, we, we we got the firm in in I forget the name of the firm in Canberra to do it. Um, I I'm not sure. I can't answer that question. Um, and the, all the footage is now online. Like a lot of the universities are putting all this footage up online for research, yeah. just poor research. And so that's that's why I, I, I was querying the NFSA lacking lacking an actual online um, open access portal um, for, for all the digitization work you're doing, whereas a lot of these organizations around Australia are actually doing that. They, they might be doing it um, to, to the exact same standard, but I, I know at the University of Wollongong, we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on it as well. So I, I'm just saying there's, there's a, for the last decade, there's been this great digitization incentive, especially in the higher education sector and especially around our open access as part of research support. And um, as I said, uh, digitization of, of news footage, local news footage of lots of lots of material. So there's, a, and I think some of the um, historical um, groups might be doing that as well. And in doing that, they're often going to um, the, 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 the main digitize, digitize, um, digital uh, digitization firm in Canberra. I'll just forget their name at the moment. What's the main one? It'll be probably damn smart. Yeah, damn smart. We yeah, hundreds of thousands of dollars of damn smart work. So, um, so yeah, that's that's been carried on, and I don't think it's being coordinated. Or I don't think, as I said, I think the NFSA should at least be seen to be as a bit of a lead in in, in bringing some of that together, and maybe just having a a big portal that brings some of it together, or something like that, without necessarily expending too much, but just as part of the whole promotion of the digitization of Australia's film heritage. It's it's been resourcing. I mean we had it, it goes back to that again. I think our scanity now, our our press scanner is now 10 years old. Um and um whilst it, it, it has been you know a real workforce, a workhorse for us. Um, the uh, we had uh, an MWA scanner, uh, which was small gauge, which finally gave up the ghost. Um, and it is through, um, I guess, our AVA funding that we've been able to afford um, a state of the art laser graphics, which will come online uh, in June. Um, and so we're holding over a couple of important films um, because it's a gentler mechanism for the films that we um, want to put across there. Um, and the scan station. We do have um, what we call a distribution scanner, but that that um, you know delivers the access outcomes. For us, though, in terms of the archive and in uh, because we're looking at, at the the volume of material that we have to get through, I think we've got enough um, we've got enough titles to keep us scanning now for about fifty years, um, and that's just sitting as it is, if not a little bit longer. Um, so again, Michael, it's just been it's just been resourcing. Well, I'm not I'm not saying the NFSA should do any of this. I'm saying the NFSA 
NFSA should be talking to these organisations and saying, look, you know, um, you've got this, we've got this, we've got this. And, and there should be a big portal, I think, where all of that digitised film relating to the history of Australia is accessible to, to, to schools, to universities, to students, to researchers. And at the moment, it's not. It's all distributed all over the place. You go to the University of Wollongong's online website or the new University of Newcastle or Melbourne or whatever. So that's that's what I'm talking about. It's not about you doing more work. It, the only work would be in the promotion and and liaison as as, as the national film and sound archive. Because okay. you've got all these state-run archives. You've got the university sector, the state libraries, the um that's what I was talking about. It's, it's just yep. a promotion or an aggregation kind of okay. role. Well, so, well Spread, spread the word. Take that on notice, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have one um, question about whether contemporary filmmakers, this is from Richard, whether contemporary filmmakers should be trying to print out on 35 millimeter film. Um, and if the money is tight, would it be better at least to make 35 mil negatives, even if it's not possible to make new 35 mil prints from those? So should 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 contemporary filmmakers be trying to print out on thirty five mil? Um, I don't know many budgets that would allow for that to get to. I mean, even getting to a digital internet, I think. And Andrew is being um, practitioner at this point in time. You're still producing. And, in, and indeed, um, Andrew had a, had a question. Mm. So if you. Follow up from that. Um, unmute. Yep. Unmuted. Um, thank you. There. I just wanted to follow on on um, Michael's uh, comments, and I just wanted to reflect on the fact that when I first got involved with the NFSA uh, uh, collection, when it was a, a, a it became a standalone statutory authority. One of the activities of the archive was to uh, provide advice to what was known as, I think, the distributed national collection, that is, elements of a national collection that were managed by uh, other organisations, other libraries, universities, etc. And uh, that was something the NFSA used to take on as part of its... Um, uh, day job, but that's uh, a long time ago. When... It is, and I, I think again. I mean, we still. I mean, you know, in, in curatorial, we in you know, we still talk about the spirit of the DNC, and we work, and you know, in some ways, um, that's where the Ava project um, has come from in relation to in national collect other national collecting institutions. Um, but it's something that hasn't been administered, I think, for a while, Andrew. Just out of resourcing. It's um, it's a question of resourcing, and I think that that lies behind the uh, the need that Michael. Uh, yeah. No, I, I hear it. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, filmmakers going uh, preserving their film on thirty five millimeter, I think that. Uh, uh, I, I really can't comment on that, uh, but I think that it is very important for filmmakers who are creating digital-born content, digital-born films, to ensure that the highest possible uh, quality of digital files are preserved at multiple locations uh, for for the future, the big the big issue is really with uh, in the digital era, as Gail knows and and is working on with the Restores program, is with uh, material that was created on film, and then in the digital age, remas duplicated onto uh, modes like one inch tape or digi beta and material just gets lost it, the 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 uh, 
the archive is doing essential work in gathering those film elements from all around the the country. And uh, we have to be patient while that work is done. But I think should filmmakers preserve their digital born content on film, um, I think that it's a funding question and I, I don't know that there's a practical need if backups are created, backup files of best quality material. As a distributor, we have real trouble on in many cases getting filmmakers to find their original master tapes. <laughs> it's a tragedy. Uh, we've got one at the moment, a wonderful uh, First Nations film that the best thing we've got is that the filmmaker can find or that we can find is um, a, a file derived from a digi beta, which is, you know, it's not good. It's mm. not good at all. The credits are blurry and so on. So backing up the best possible quality is so important and the standards need to be really, the filmmakers need to be really aware of that need. Because I think, I mean, I think, you know, when you think about it and for future production, when people want to include that material, uh, you know, excerpts or whatever from another work in a documentary or whatever they're making, they're going to expect um, a level of those new those new projects uh, are going to expect the best possible um, available you know of material that's been that's been archived. And look over the years, things you know, film practitioners you know in the hurly burly of of making material and making content, um, things get lost. I mean, you know, interposers go overseas or original picture negs go somewhere and. Then, then it's lost, and and so what's really important is actually having the the communication um, with um, with the other archives around the world. Because as I said, we're all we're all discovering, and and things like machine learning and AI are, are going to allow us to um, you know discover a lot more material uh, within the collection. Gail, a number of people have, have left um, the, the discussion today, but all of them have said as they're leaving, thank you for your excellent work on restoration at the NFSA and, and for your whole time there and how much people are appreciating the extraordinary archiving work at the NFSA um, by, by, by you and, and, and by the team. We are very grateful to you for <laughs> giving up a Sunday afternoon in such delightful weather. Thank you so very much. Um, it, it was a very eye-opening and, and a great experience. So thank you very much, Gail. Really great. Okay. Um, I see David Adamson's got a hand up. Uh, David, oh. if you want to email me um, uh, your question and see if I can help you after offline. Okay. It's all right. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, thank everybody. Thank you very much, Gail. And okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.